time to attend our 63rd uh, town hall. And we will, you know, allow people to come in. We have uh, probably another 10 or 12 or 15 spots, but when we hit capacity, we will hit capacity. And so we want to make sure that we keep you all safe as well. Um, for those of you guys who choose to wear masks, it's great. For those of you who don't, it's great. Um, we just want to make sure we keep a respectful environment here. A few more housekeeping and things before we get started. Obviously, I'm Chrissy Houlihan, and uh, hopefully I had the opportunity to say hi to each and every one of you, and if I didn't, I'm sorry, and please make sure you get to me as, I, as you walk out the door. Um, there are exits here and over here, so if for whatever reason there is an emergency, please know that this is the way that we should be going. There are restrooms right outside here across the hall. Um, this is the fifth town hall that we've done in person in the last 90 days, and uh, I wanted to give you that update as well. So let's go ahead and move to the agenda, and I'll try and... All right. But if you just want to do the introduction. Sure. I'm going to go to the, the agenda, the slide on the agenda. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to spend about an hour with one another. Uh, we're going to go over something called meeting norms before we get started. By a show of hands, how many of you guys have been to one of my town halls before? Okay, great. So if some of you guys know that we try and set the stage for how we're going to behave with one another during the course of today, because I think we all really would like to just have a conversation and we'd like to learn from one another. Um, we will give a little bit of an update. This is sort of a scene setter for all of us of what's going on in Washington, D.C. and what's going on in our community. And we do that because a lot of you all most likely will have some of the same questions. And I want to make sure that I'm giving you kind of the best information that I have about what's been happening in Washington, D.C. and here in our community. And then we will be able to answer some of your questions. If we're not able to get to all of them, we will make sure that we get to you by, by phone within the next couple of business days. Maria from the library will be an, uh, sorting the questions that you all ask so that she uh, will weed out the, the ones that are the same so that we don't go over the same one 16 times, which sometimes happens. So that's our agenda. Let's go ahead and move on while Aubrey works on the slides and move to our norms. Um, I used to be a classroom teacher. I taught high school chemistry in North Philadelphia for a time. And as you can probably appreciate, there's something called classroom management. That's really, really important for anybody who's been an educator. And what we're trying to do here in our community is we're trying to reset the standards of how we behave with and among each other. I think that we are an incredibly awesome community of people. And I think what's important is that we, we understand that we're all here for one reason and one reason only. And in my opinion, the reason is we're patriots. We all believe in this nation. We all want to serve all uh, the nation, but we also want to make sure that we're uh, raising our families and living our lives in this amazing uh, nation together as safely and respectfully as we can of one another. So to that end, we are setting a norm here that we will treat each other with respect and with decency that we will use our time wisely, and I will do my very best to be able to um, stick to the agenda and to stick to the timeline so that we can make sure we get you, at you here out, out of here on time. That if for whatever reason that we have any conflicts with one another, that we know that we're all approaching this because we are all patriots. We all believe in this nation, and we all want to make sure that the best things happen for each and every one of us. We won't think about this as an individual issue, but rather we'll think about it as a policy issue, possibly. And lastly, we will not discuss politics here. We will be discussing policy here. Um, so I think that, that if, as long as we set that stage of expectations, in my experience for the 62 town halls that we've already had, we've had very, very good conversations where I think everybody feels listened to and also heard. So that's what we will go ahead and do with our norms. Um, so I apologize, just it's gonna be in this format for whatever reason, it's just not letting me start it. Um, so just be, you'll be able to see everything. Oh, meaning that it'll just be boxed out like yeah. that. Okay, that's great. I can do that. Um, so while uh, Aubrey finishes that up, I will say each and every one of you, I hope, got a card. Uh, please fill out the card um, with any question that you might have. And one question, uh, request that we have is that you please um, use as best the penmanship as you can. Um, I used to say that if I had ever known that I was going to run for Congress, I would have done two things differently. I would have learned better handwriting and better penmanship, and my Spanish would be a lot better. Um, those would have been useful things to, to have. But we will collect those uh, cards and we will hand them over to Maria and she will be working on them. Let's go ahead and move here. For those of you guys who've never been to a town hall before, I want to first set the stage of where we are. 
and um, what, I, what community that I'm able to represent for us. We are in Chester, uh, actually we're in Berks County, but I live in Chester County. The community that we serve, that I serve, is all of uh, Chester County and the lower portions of Berks County. This is the congressional district as it stands now. This is the congressional district with the redistricting or the redrawing. So as you can see in uh, the next year or the next election, the sixth congressional district has a little bit more of a bump out in Berks County than it had before. It is still uh, largely the same in the sense that it's still about 40% Democrat, 40% Republican, and 20% independent. And I wanna pause there for a minute so you guys hear that. This community is 40% Democrat, 40% Republican, and 20% independent. It's a purple, purple place. And what's really, really cool about that is there's really not very many of those in our nation. There's about, there's about 435, not just about, but, but actually, 435 seats in Congress, and only about three or four, actually three and a half dozen or so are those purple, purple places. And so we're unusual. And when I'm down in Washington, D.C., and I talk about us as a community, I explain to that to people that that's our composition, but I also tell people that we are all remarkable people and that we really work together to get along, forget about whatever our political affiliation is. We are, as an example, one of the highest vaccinated communities in the country. And that's pretty darn cool, yeah. So this is just to give you a, a, slash, a, slash, a, a slide of where we are. Let's go ahead and move on. So we're gonna transition now into our congressional update, now that we know who I represent. We're gonna go over a bunch of different things here that I hope will answer some of your questions about um, issues that you may have regular questions about, and hopefully that way we won't end up having to have a lot of individual questions. The first thing that we're gonna focus on is something that's called the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is a piece of legislation that was passed a few months ago down in Washington, D.C. It was passed that way, if you guys remember your schoolhouse rock, that means the Senate passed it, the House passed it, and the President signed it. That means it's actually law. The Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act was passed bipartisanly, and that means that in the Senate, there were, I think, 13 or 14 folks on the Republican side who voted for it. In the House, there were about 13 or 14 uh, Republican folks who voted on it. So out of the 435 members of the House, only 13 Republicans crossed the aisle. But on the Senate side, many, many Republicans passed the, across the aisle, which is really, really good. This piece of legislation is ginormous. It's the first of its kind in nearly 30 years. And it focuses on water, air, roads, uh, broadband, bridges, and uh, transportation of one form or another. It is billions and billions of dollars. In fact, it adds up to trillions of dollars, but I'll focus a little bit on what each and every one of these things does. Roads and bridges. It upgrades our roads and bridges with approximately $11.3 billion for funding here in Pennsylvania for federal highway programs, $1.6 billion for bridge replacements over five years, which of course will help our Commonwealth restore a lot of its roadways and bridges. For rail, it will eliminate the Amtrak maintenance backlog. Many of us rely on Amtrak in one way, shape, or form. It will expand rail service nationwide. It will modernize our transit systems, including for those of us who use SEPTA, it includes that as well. Um, it's particularly focused on the Northeastern Corridor, which is for some of us, depending on where we live in the community, part of how we trans uh, transit from place to place. For water, it's really, really important because it addresses two things that I think are relatively important to this community. We have water problems, two kinds. One is we have lead in our pipes. One is we also have um, uh, flooding issues in our area. So these are two specific parts of the bill that will be helpful for our community uh, to improve our water infrastructure. I talked a little bit about bridges. There are 3,353 3, bridges in our area, 7,500 and 7,500 miles of highway in poor condition. And so this is one of the things that I think we will start seeing happening in our community relatively soon. If you see infrastructure stuff that's happening right now in our community, likely it is not necessarily the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act yet, because it takes a while to go from the federal government to the state government to the local government. And there are many things in our community that are what's called shovel ready. There are a lot of projects that people had already planned on that really wanted to do and just didn't have the resources to do it. And so those are likely going to be the first ones that you start seeing. Some of the things that you're seeing in our community that are being done on highways and bridges and tunnels and those sorts of things 
come from the American Rescue Plan as well, which has been a part of legislation for quite some time uh, and is, um, has aspects to it of water, of, of air, of all of those kinds of things. This bill also has a significant environmental aspect to it, meaning it is um, helping to make sure that we have the, the infrastructure to be able to have increasingly more and more electric vehicles in our country. And it also, as I mentioned, has a pretty significant component of broadband. I know later on today I'm going to be traveling in and around this community, and Aubrey is from here. She's from Honeybrook area, and she warned me that my cell service wouldn't work too terribly well in some areas. And so this is what that's about, right? That's about bringing broadband to everyone. Um, next slide. We're also going to talk real quickly about what I just alluded to, the American Rescue Plan, which was a very big piece of legislation that passed during COVID. Um, this is something that allowed us to be able to get to where we are here in the community now in terms of being able to provide resources for schools to revamp their HVAC, to make sure that they had the ability to keep their schools clean, to make sure that police departments, fire departments, emergency departments had PPE and other kinds of things that would allow them to continue. Come on in, Sam. Yeah, there's a seat right there as well, and then a couple back there. Um, and this also allowed us to be able to, um, in some cases, keep our businesses open, in some cases, be able to work remotely, in some cases, being able to have earned income child tax credit. So this was a very big piece of legislation that addressed kind of COVID and how we could get ourselves back on our feet. I also explained to people down in Washington that this part of our country has been under siege from COVID since the very beginning. And there aren't a lot of parts of our country that have been here in this place for so long. Um, we are, I, my dad was born in Poland and he used to tell me that Poland was this place that everybody just trounced up and down and across, you know, generation after generation. I feel like Pennsylvania is sort of like that too. You know, we're the gateway to the Northeast, we're the gateway to the South, we're the gateway to the Midwest. And so that means that when we have a, a disease like, like COVID, we're constantly getting trounced. And so that's what the American Rescue Plan was about for us. Next slide. So we won't be able to layer it on. Okay. <laughs> so it's all of it at once. Okay, so what, I, what this slide is supposed to do, which is pretty, pretty cool when it works, it is, it layers on each one of these colors to show you what has happened in our community as a result of the American Rescue Plan and as a result of other things that have gone to help us uh, deal with COVID. And so there, are, in blue is an example, and unfortunately when the black little dudes <coughs> layer over them, you, you cover up a lot of stuff. But in blue, this is funding for our firefighters. And we will send along this stuff to you so you can watch it go live. In uh, purple, which unfortunately largely is covered, are our shuttered venue operations, our restaurant revitalization funds are buried under here in red somewhere. Excuse me, sorry about that. Um, paycheck protection program is in blue. COVID relief funds are in green. Provider relief funds are in a different blue. And IDOL is in black, the emergency disaster loans process. And so why this slide, if it were being shown with its layering is more impactful, but is still quite impactful is, it's really hard to imagine the billions and trillions of dollars that the federal government has assessed and addressed for this, for COVID and for other stressors. It's really, really hard because that's huge numbers, right? But when you boil it down to the billions and billions and billions of dollars that have come right here to our community in all of these different ways, shapes, or forms in these packages, that's, I think, pretty impactful. And again, I really wish you could see kind of what underneath all of them, because the number of restaurants we've helped, the number of uh, fire and, and, uh, and police uh, forces we've helped, uh, the number of small businesses we've helped is really astounding with this piece of legislation. And so we will be sharing that with you later so you can play with it. The next thing, speaking of small businesses, for those who have met me before, you know that although I was a teacher and I am a veteran, I also am primarily an entrepreneur, and I've spent most of my life here in this community, specifically in Chester County, growing a bunch of different businesses. And so I consider myself to be, first and foremost, an entrepreneur. So I'm really, really lucky to serve on the Small Business Committee. Um, I'm one of the few people there who have a small business background. Um, and so some of the things that I want to highlight here is um, how our economy is moving forward. Can you just by show of raise of hand, who has heard of the Paycheck Protection Program? Good, that's really good. This was a piece of legislation that's part of the American Rescue Plan, and we, we actually renewed it in some cases, that provided $2.2 billion in our community alone, 
to help small businesses be able to uh, keep their doors open if that was appropriate or keep their employees and their um, overhead going if that was appropriate as well. I led a successful effort within this PPP program for those uh, businesses that were below $150,000, you know, that borrowed below $150,000 to be able to have a more streamlined process to be able to get that from a loan uh, to a grant. So about 90% of all of the money that went through PPP was for below $150,000. So I wanna say that again, because this is really important. 90% of the loans that went for Paycheck Protection Program went for businesses that were borrowing less than $150,000. And so I led a piece of legislation that said for those businesses that are borrowing below $150,000, they don't have the accountants and the lawyers and the you know all partridges and the pear trees to be able to fill out the paperwork and get through that process to be able to move that, that loan to a grant, which is how the process was designed. And so that not only streamlined it for them, the businesses, but it also streamlined it for the lending institutions who should be focusing in the case of oversight on the places where they needed the oversight the most, which is the $150,000 and above loans so that the banking, the lending institutions were focusing in the right place. Um, I also led an effort to keep our entertainment venues uh, up and going. This is called the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant. Places like the Reading Fighting Phils, which I hope to be at this weekend, uh, possibly. The Fox Theaters and our own Colonial Theater down in Phoenixville are all places that were helped by this grant uh, program for shuttered venues. I didn't know really just how important the arts were, I don't think many of us did, until uh, COVID struck. And when we realized we couldn't go to the movies or we didn't have live theater or we couldn't, you know, um, listen to music. This was something that I think all of us universally decided was important and a value of ours. Our restaurants were also very important to us. There's something called the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, which has been part of the, res uh, the work that we've been doing. I believe that it hasn't been enough and supported having it be uh, more resources, more money uh, for that. But this is a, um, a process where we all have to agree. And so, so far, you know, we haven't all agreed on that particular issue. Here's a quote from a restaurant, uh, a brewing company that says, to be here as long as we have is only because of the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Um, and I will last end this slide by saying, I'm really, really proud that uh, as a small business person myself that I've been recognized by the Chamber of Commerce, the US Chamber of Commerce for the Abraham Lincoln Leadership Award, which recognizes members uh, who are demonstrating bipartisan leadership and constructive government uh, necessary to move this country forward. So I'll move on to the next slide. How am I doing with time, Aubrey? No worries. Okay, good. Uh, small business and the economy. Um, earlier this month, it's my, it was my privilege, I guess it was last month now, to host two cabinet secretaries from the Biden administration. One of the things that a member of Congress tries to do is make sure that they, he or she, um, brings people from the administration, whomever the administration is, to our community so that they understand what it means to live here. Uh, you know, an example we'll go over is the VA as an example. When the VA became an issue, I wanted to make sure to bring the secretary of the VA here to explain you know, what it meant to live here. Uh, in this particular case, we were able to host Secretary of Commerce Gina Raimondo here, and there she is over in one of our semiconductor companies in our community. You didn't probably know it, but one of the, the largest semiconductor companies in the world is headquartered here in our community. And I was also able to sponsor Isabella Guzman, and she's the head of the Small Business Administration. Uh, and she and I visited some community, uh, some, uh, in, uh, what do you call them, incubators, which are places where we try to grow small businesses. Um, uh, so I could focus with her on the important community as an example of Coatesville. Um, so I also try whenever I have people in from Washington to bring them to the places that need it the most to make sure that people understand what's going on in places like, frankly, I've had a chance to visit Morgantown quite a bit. We have a challenge here. We have a challenge because we have lots of jobs here, but we don't have a good way to get people to these jobs here. So this is one of the things that I focused on when I talked to the transportation secretary, as an example. Um, let's move to the next slide. Speaking of um, business challenges, supply chain. Um, how many of y'all knew what a supply chain was three years ago? <laughs> okay, more, I guess. I knew what a supply chain was because my undergraduate and master's degree and my thesis is on supply chain management. Um, so this is my kind of engineering. This is something that I um, am passionate about. 
and supply chains were what I worked on when I was in industry. Um, and so I uh, am very concerned about what's going on with supply chains, and we all should. I'm very concerned about what's going on with inflation. We all should be. Um, we recognize that this is something uh, that we should be working towards to ameliorate the pressures and the pains that are on each and every one of us. In my opinion, we are working to ameliorate these because we have successfully tried to pull ourselves out of the pandemic. And it, our alternative would have been something very, very, very bleak. I serve on a, a, a bipartisan caucus called the Problem Solvers Caucus. So caucuses for the young people who are in the crowd are like clubs, you know, in high school and college. <laughs> um, but the, par the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus and another group that I'm part of called the New Democratic Coalition, which is a uh, pro-business democratic group of uh, uh, members of Congress, we all listened to all kinds of experts while we were designing or helping to design what our response was to the pandemic and what our response was to um, the stress of Ukraine as an example. And each and every one of the people from past administrations, both Republican and Democratic, would say to us, at least this is what my, my feedback was, is don't do too little. Don't regret that you did too little. Uh, the 2007-2008 experience, bipartisanly, remember it was across two different uh, administrations, two different parties, um, they felt as though they were worried that they hadn't done enough. And so that was something that resounded in my mind. So here we are, we have uh, an issue with supply chain uh, and inflation, but we have some strategies to address it. Here is an example is, whoops, I'm, is, I'm making sure that we haven't changed the slide. This used to be a vote on the, um, on the Ocean and Shipping Reform Act. We know that part of our supply chain problem is with uh, shipping containers coming from overseas and shipping containers going back uh, home. We understand that originally, way, way long ago, a shipping container would cost about $2,000. Now shipping, actually, in the, in the near term, it costs about $20,000. That price is now going down to ten dollars and $8,000. So the good news is that there's, there's movement going on at the federal level. The good news is there's movement going on with, with business as well. The good news is in places like where shipping is influencing our pricing, we should start feeling relief in this particular area. I'm not going to promise that it's going to be, you know, huge and and and, and uh, back to normal in any, you know, couple months or anything like that. But this is this is what this is all about: is passing legislation and recognizing that this is an issue and working to to uh, move it down. Another thing is, I got appointed to a group that's called uh, the Conferee for the America Competes Act. Some of our problems with supply chain are with technologies like chips, right? You guys, I waited nine months for an oven. I'm sure you guys are waiting for a car. Like all kinds of people have, have struggled with things that require these technologies in them. This is a piece of legislation, again, bipartisan, uh, both Democrats and Republicans, bicameral, both the Senate and the House. We each passed a version of this bill that addresses bringing more jobs back to the United States, more manufacturing back to the United States, specifically in chip manufacturing, uh, bringing more resources to research and development in the United States. And so where we sit right now is the House has a piece of this legislation and has passed it, the Senate has a piece of this legislation and has passed it, and now we go to conference and we agree on the things we can agree on, we vote on it again, and we send it to the President for his signature. So it's my hope that this piece of legislation will pass before the end of the summer. In fact, if it's going to pass, it has to frankly pass between now and the next three weeks because that's when August recess is. Um, and so I'm lucky enough to have been appointed to be one of the conferees on this. So I'm one of the people who's at the table, so to speak, making sure that we are well represented and trying to make sure that we get this piece of legislation through. So please pay attention to that. The next thing, before I move on in regards to inflation is, um, I, as I mentioned, was in part of a group called the New Dem Coalition. It's a group of Democrats that work together on issues of business. Um, we created, I helped create a um, infrastructure, I'm sorry, an inflation working group. We put together this report. We unfortunately have run out of copies, but we'll send you links for it, which Forbes magazine said was the most effective piece of legislation make sure I get this right. Uh, Congressional Democrats just offered the best inflation plan they had, not just for it, Democrats, but for anything that's come out of Washington. So if you'd like to see some of the things that we're encouraging both the House and the Senate to do, as well as the administration to do on inflation, this will be that, that resource for you. Okay, 
supply chain inflation, healthcare. Am I okay on time? Mm -hmm. Okay. So healthcare. When I started running for Congress five or six years ago, healthcare, 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 it was like the most important thing. It really, really still is. And what's unfortunate is that we don't talk enough about it now because we've got so many other things to talk about. So I wanna make sure that we talk about it here. Importantly, the American Rescue Plan that was passed to address COVID increased health insurance coverage by 21% in this country. It was because we recognize that we're all interrelated, right? My health, if I cough and sneeze on you, you're gonna get sick. Um, and so we all need to be able to have the resources that we need for healthcare. Unfortunately, this may go away in the short term. In the short term, so I'm working to make sure that what we push forward in the American Rescue Plan continues on into the future because I think it's important to continue to have that increase of 21% uh, be insured. We are also trying to lower drug costs in two ways, and I would encourage you to pay attention to this too. One is a piece of legislation that was called the Build Back Better which was huge and frankly, way, way, you know, lots and lots of stuff. But one piece of it had to do with negotiating, the government negotiating uh, with industry for prescription drugs, for about 300 of them. I think it's really, really popular. Um, it also returns a lot of money to the government because we save money. Um, and so this part of the Build Back Better legislation is something that we still might have an opportunity to pass within the next three or four weeks. So please watch the Senate for this, because this is something that's been passed in the House. It needs to be passed in the Senate. And then hopefully we'll be able to relieve some of the drug prices problems that we're experiencing uh, as individuals. There also was a piece of legislation that the House passed that I would encourage you to ask your senators to think about, which was capping the price of insulin at $35. This is something that people have asked over and over and over again. If we can't focus on the 300 drugs that everybody wants to focus on, can we at least do them one at a time? Uh, and so this is one that I would encourage you guys to ask your senators about. This one is something that I am helping to lead, which is the Telehealth Modernization Act. Many of us realize that we can do a lot of our healthcare now online or on the phone. Um, we can do it with our smartphones, and we can do it in the case of those of us who don't have smartphones by phone phone. Um, and so we want to make sure that all of the advances that we made um, because of COVID that we keep in place. Um, because people have gotten used to this, you know, doctors and regular human beings have gotten used to this, and we want to make sure we keep this process in place as well. Next slide. Mm, more healthcare. <coughs> <clears throat> okay, healthcare. I do recognize, however, that we have huge issues in our community with healthcare. For those who are following along, we've lost, we lost two hospitals, and third one is not in this community, but is outside of our district, but something that we, that we use. And we also were, for a time, under threat of possibly losing the VA. So these are major changes in health care in our community. Many of these changes from a federal perspective are things that are hard for me to you know, put, put our stamp on, but things that regardless, I'm working really hard to make sure that whatever I can do at the federal level, I'm doing. Uh, we've recently seen that one of those two hospitals that was going to be closed has been purchased and will be reopened, which is terrific. I know that they're working on a similar thing, not the same, parties but other parties to try and resuscitate the other hospital in our area and please know to the degree that I'm allowed by, by ethics to be engaged in that I am um, there are limitations to what it is that I can how I can be engaged and what I can share with you about how I am engaged um, this is a picture of course of the Chester County Hospital not in, not uh, struggling because of that issue but struggling because of that issue the Paoli Hospital those hospitals that remain open in our area are very much um, struggling because they're getting more patients. They're having more you know, uh, emergency room visits and ambulances are coming to them more. So we recognize that this is an issue. We're trying to make sure that some of our American Rescue Plan dollars are being aimed at some of these people who are trying to save the, the hospitals. Uh, and so to the degree that federal money can be help, helping bring uh, hospitals back, that's part of what we're working on here. Next slide. Ukraine. Um, I mentioned my dad was born in Poland. He was actually born in Lviv, which is now part of Ukraine. Um, so my dad is 80 years old. 
80 years ago, Lviv was under siege during World War II, um, and now uh, the nation of Ukraine is, is once again under siege. Um, I was really lucky to be able to travel as part of the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm part of the Foreign Affairs Committee to Ukraine. This is me meeting President Zelensky um, about three weeks before the invasion. And having the opportunity to talk to him and talk to all of his cabinet members about um, the stress that was happening in that part of the world and why it's so important to the, to the rest of the world. This is the first time in my five years where people started asking me a lot of questions about global issues. Most of the time in, in settings like this, I will get no questions on international issues. Um, but now with Ukraine, I think people are starting to recognize why this is important. And also importantly, how it's affecting supply chains, how it's affecting national security, what it means for China, what it means for Taiwan. I think we've all learned a lot in the last six or so months about why a little place like Ukraine, which frankly isn't that little, I think it's the second largest uh, country in, in Europe, is important to us. So I am working uh, alongside my colleagues. This is Representative uh, Brian Fitzpatrick, who's a Republican from Pennsylvania, uh, to make sure that we are uh, addressing these, this issue as rapidly as we can. Some of the stresses we're having on oil, some of the stresses we're having on um, uh, fertilizers, all of, there are things that are coming out of that part of the world that are being particularly affected by Ukraine. So the faster that we are able to come to peace, a peaceful situation uh, for Ukraine, the better we are able to manage some of the food issues that we're having and some of the oil issues we're having as well. Next slide. We need to go a little bit quicker. Oh, did you skip one of them? Yes. Okay. Hurricane Ida. I, before I skip the one that she skipped, um, <laughs> I do want to say that um, for those of you guys who followed along in the news with Zelensky, I sat with President Zelensky three weeks before the attack. We asked him, what did he need? And at that time, three weeks before the attack, he said, I don't need anything. I want you to stop talking about this. It's scaring my people, it's scaring the markets. Effectively, I don't believe you. You know, have, welcome to Ukraine, we've been at this for 14 years. So I want people to hear that because we did have moved mountains over the, the course of the last uh, four or five months, going from please don't talk about it anymore to all the things that we've done. And I just wanna make sure that people understand, like I literally saw him say that uh, to us. Okay, hurricane update. Sorry, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> hurricane update. Uh, Chester County, not Berks, but Chester was affected uh, to the degree that it ended up being a federal state of emergency. So we ended up working with a pandemic, with a you know global war, and with uh, Hurricane Ida all at the same time. We set up a, a disaster center with FEMA. Um, here I am meeting with um, the Downingtown Police Department, the water level was up to here. This is the, the gutting of the Downingtown Police Department to talk about how we can uh, rebuild and make sure that we, when we rebuild it, we rebuild it for resilience, um, meaning maybe we don't end up putting it in the same place. Maybe we end up using some of the resources that are part of the American Rescue Plan or part of the Infrastructure Act to think about where the water's coming from and where it will continue to go. Um, next slide. First responders. Uh, I mentioned that I'm a vet, uh, my dad's a vet, my grandfather's a vet, my husband's grandfather is a form, uh, was a chief of police. Service uh, is really important to my family. Um, and my brother is a army medic and a uh, surgical nurse in Iowa. So I think just making sure that you hear from me the importance to me and my family of the people who, who save us every day. Um, so we are working, this office is working uh, faithfully to make sure that we're taking care of our first responders. President Biden's budget this year and last year had a pretty significant increase for uh, funding for police. Um, and there is a piece of legislation that I would encourage you all to encourage people to, to look at that's called the Invest to Protect Act. It is a piece of legislation, it's bipartisan. It's, it's uh, started with the Problem Solvers Caucus, which remember I'm, I'm a part of, so there's 56 members of the, of the Problem Solvers Caucus. I have 23 and 23 Republicans and Democrats. We put together this piece of legislation for police departments that are smaller than 200 people. 
and that's a very big part of our community. We don't have, I don't even, I can't even name one that has 200 people in it. Um, and so th the problem is, is those that are small end up having to compete with those that are large for grants and opportunities. And we wanna make sure that we're investing in our smaller community uh, police forces as well, to make sure that they have training that they need, to make sure that they have equipment that they need, to make sure they're working with our communities as they need to be. Uh, and here's just a, a little thing uh, on the Invest to Protect. The reason I ask for you to pay attention to this is I'm a supporter of this, but please talk to your senators about this as well. Next slide. Community protection funding, project funding. Uh, this is a relatively new uh, program, two years old now. It, it uh, reflects a program that used to exist in Congress and the Senate years ago. But the process is that people in our community submit ideas to, the, to our congressional office. And then our congressional office has developed a um, independent process of looking through the ideas, ranking them, putting them on a matrix, and suggesting which one we're going to put forward to the federal government for approval and for funding. This actually helps quite a bit because it helps us direct things to where they need to be. Um, and so last year was the first time this, this process came back and we were able to put uh, quite a lot of money into our community. Here's some of them. Sinking Springs, I think for some of you guys who know that area, you know how hard it is to get in and out of that area. Mm. We're trying to help with the roadways there. Reading Rail, you know, self-explanatory. EV charging, working families, um, I'm, you know, sewage systems, really sexy, exciting things like that. <laughs> these, are, these are all the things that the community asked for. And we were able to get, I think, 14 out of 15. Nine out, Nine out of 10. This time we have 15. Yeah. Nine out of 10 we were able to get. So that's that's really cool. And here's one of the checks there. We have 15 on the docket this time. And we hope to get all 15 of them. All right, um, we're almost there. And then we're up, up to your questions. Uh, serving our community. Um, I want to make sure that you understand that I run this place as a business. Um, I cost you, my office costs you $1.3, $1.4 million a year and we wanna make sure that we are profitable. So far in the three and a half years I've been in office, we've returned $11 million to our, to our community in things that we can expressly show you that we brought money back to our community. So we've cost you again 1.3 a year. Over the course of three and a half years, we've brought you back $11 million. Uh, we can talk later on what kind of services we can provide, but this ranges anywhere from IRS to the VA to Social Security to, you know, you name it if it's federal, we can help you with it. Next slide. Coatesville. Those of you who are paying attention on this area know that we have uh, a VA hospital in our, in our district and that that VA hospital was one of 11 hospitals on the um, list that was, was put forward as recommended for closure uh, or for modification. This came from a piece of legislation called the Mission Act that was passed in the Trump administration. And the Mission Act said, understandably, that we need to look at all of the ways that we take care of our veterans. We need to make sure that we're doing it in the most efficient way, both for the vets and as well for the people who pay for it. We wanna go out, the Mission Act said, and create a report that says what we should be doing to be more effective with our VAs. Unfortunately, that report came back and it said, the Coatesville VA should be one of the VAs that we should consider closing or modifying. The Philadelphia VA also was one. So we ended up with two in our area. We went, Mr. Dwight Evans and I, Representative Dwight Evans and I, to the Secretary of the VA and were like, what, why, you know? And the explanation was, well, let me come and visit you. This report was done before COVID was an issue, before the two hospitals in our area were closed. Um, and before a lot of things. And so we brought him up here and we talked to him. We had him meet with a lot of people, whether they were uh, employees of the VA or, or people who benefit from it or the hospital administrators around our community to try to make sure he understood what was going on. The bottom line I'll leave you with here is that this process, this mission report is likely going nowhere. I don't just mean for our community, I mean for the country because the timelines are expiring on this. We need to have appointed nine people to oversee the commission that, that oversees the results of this. We still, uh, the Senate still has not appointed one of those nine and all nine of them have to be confirmed and all of them need to be able to present their report by January. So none of them has been confirmed, no report has been started and a report needs to be done by January. 
So the likelihood that a lot of this stuff is going to happen is very, very small. Um, let's move on. Here's some family stuff. This is me standing outside of the fifth um, infant formula manufacturing company in the country. There were four before the infant formula manufacturing crisis existed, and those four were very, very big. This fifth one happened by coincidence to open in our community during the infant formula crisis. So we were able to rush uh, funding to them from all different sources to be able to increase production uh, to be able to increase um, domestic production for all people who needed infant formula. So this is one of those. Before we move, this is not nearly big enough for us to talk about, but this is, because we are running out of time, talking about uh, women's health and reproductive freedoms. I would like to spend more time on this, but I will spend time by saying I am firmly pro-choice. Uh, I recognize that that is not all of us in our community, um, and I respect that. Uh, and I will vote once again to protect a woman's right uh, to, to control her own reproductive freedom. And so we will move on from that, and if there are questions about that, I can answer them. Gun violence protection, um, and then I think that's it. We have maybe one more thing to go. Um, this is another thing where I'm a Democrat. I don't, you guys probably figured that out. Um, but when I was running, when I was running for Congress, I was told, if you're running for Congress in our community, don't talk about guns. Don't talk about gun safety. Um, and I basically decided as a candidate that as a veteran and as a teacher and as a mom, that if I couldn't talk about this issue, then, then that was a real problem. Um, I really do believe that there are things that we can do to keep our, our community, bless you, our community safer uh, and to protect our children and to protect ourselves. And I do believe in the Second Amendment, uh, but I do believe that there is a way forward to be able to protect and defend us and make us more safe as a community. Um, so I told my team, my campaign team, that if that was the thing that made me lose, then I was not the right person to represent our community. Uh, and I think that what's interesting in our community is even though we're purple, even though we're R's and D's and I's, I really think the vast majority of us, and I'm talking about between 70 and 90%, depending on what issue you're asking people about, really believe that there are things that we can be doing to make our community safer. And this is one of them. This is the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act, again, bipartisan, passed by House and Senate. And these are some of the things that were in that piece of legislation that were agree agreed upon both by the House and the Senate and signed into law. Next slide. Uh, da -da -da. More. Yes, I already spoke about that. So we can go forward. National security. Um, I serve on the Armed Services Committee. So, uh, so for those of you who have been paying attention, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee. I'm on the Armed Services Committee, and I'm on the Small Business Committee. A lot of the work that I do is on the Armed Services Committee because this is one piece of legislation that happens every single year. And there's very, very few things that happen in Congress that actually happen every single year. And because this actually happens every single year, you're able to put a lot of interesting things in it that, that help our community. And so some of those things, um, as an example, I'm really worried about rare earth elements, critical minerals, you know, the things that it takes to make chips with. I'm able to put legislative teeth into the NDAA because, of course, our military uses chips and those sorts of things. So we need to be less reliant on China for a lot of things, but we definitely need the critical earths and rare earth elements to be part of it. So that's something that's in the NDAA. Um, measures to support military families are obvious, but things like making sure we're supporting small businesses, all of the small businesses, are things that I can put legislative language into the NDAA in to, to elevate small businesses and to make more of them. Um, and so I was able to pass 19 amendments. You'll be able to see those on, um, on our website if you'd like to see them, but they range anything from national security and critical rare earth elements to child care uh, to literacy. Um, all of those kinds of things are, I think are important. All right. <laughs> I was not fast enough. Yeah. That's a little quick. We've got okay. about 20 minutes. Okay, 20 minutes. All right, so now we come to the time where we have our questions and we have all of them into nice little meat piles. Yes, that's a little bit. Yeah, and um, we'll go ahead and
and read them, and I'll do my very best to answer them. I will tell you that one of the things I think is most important as your representative is if I don't know, I will tell you I don't know. Um, there is lots and lots uh, going on. You cannot be an expert in everything. And so for whatever reason you have a question on something that I don't know, I will be happy to get you that answer. First one, first of all, thank you for your strong advocacy on the natural agriculture. As a, sorry, so I'm going to I'm trying my best here. <laughs> As a dairy farmer of, of four generations of farming, one of my concerns is regulatory over oversight. oversight, yeah. Our food supply incredibly, is incredibly fragile, mm -hmm. but a top-down approach is dangerous as it's, as if it is, I'm sorry, cost and cycles investments. Please, um, up the hard work. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, whoever asked this question, um, one of the other things that's really interesting in the other parts of our district is our district goes from being super suburban and you know really kind of uh, Philadelphian uh, to being very rural and dairy, mushrooms, you know, uh, specialty crops, all kinds of stuff. And then north of here, it's very, very rural. It's um, I'm sorry, urban. It's the city of uh, Reading. So we've got a lot going on here. Um, one of the things that I really do try to do is help our agricultural community because it's very, very important. I probably spend, I'm sort of a, um, my friends in Congress laugh at me because I talk so much about mushrooms. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's a really good, you know, demonstration species, for lack of a better way yeah. of describing it, of what's wrong with our agriculture system, our small business system, what's wrong with why pricing is going up, you know, what's wrong with all the things. And let me focus in for a second on that. In our mushroom industry, which is similar to our dairy industry, similar because they're uh, crops that don't have seasons and rely on a workforce that isn't you know, transitory or, or temporary. Um, and we're struggling here in our community to keep our farms open, our dairy farms and our mushroom farms open. So another thing I would ask of you, is there something called the Farm Workforce Modernization Act, which was passed bipartisanly in the House twice now since I've been in Congress and hasn't been taken up in the Senate that would address some of the issues of workforce and visas. And I know whoever asked, asked this question, how painful this issue is of making sure that you have the staff you need on your farm to be able to keep operating and keep your multi-generational farm open. The other thing is, is that farms are not very much different than small businesses. And we tried really hard through the uh, Paycheck Protection Program and some of the fixes that we did th through the Paycheck Protection Program to make sure that farms and the way that farms are structured from a corporate perspective were included in the Paycheck Protection Program uh, uh, program. They weren't originally because many of our farms are structured differently than many businesses were. So we made sure to, to do that as well. I will also say in terms of da uh, dairy uh, mushrooms, I tell people, this is a great example, mushrooms are going up in price. They can't get the um, fertilizer that they need from Estonia because Ukraine, you know? Mm -hmm. They can't get the childcare that they need because they can't find enough people. The, the childcare center, nonprofit childcare center that is near many of these farms has capacity for three dozen more kids but can't find the workers to be able to uh, to work in the child care center. So that's three dozen kids worth of parents that can't go to work. Um, and so this is a complicated example of, of um, supply chain. Um, and so I appreciate whoever asked the question. I will continue to work really hard on issues of agriculture. This is one of those places where I, you, I could use your help to educate me uh, on it. My, my mom's family were farmers, but, but I am working hard to learn as much as I can on it. <coughs> I am a parent of two kids in the LGBT community. Given that Roe was kicked back to the state, and Justice Thomas has said he wants to revisit certain laws that could be a detriment into um, regressing other rights as well. Yeah. What will the Democrats do to protect these rights? <laughs> well, you know, for me, I ask that question. It's not a partisan question. Um, for me, this, in my opinion, shouldn't be R's and D's, it should be about humanity. We didn't hear the question. I'm sorry, the question is about the LGBTQ community. And what's the concern? And, and the concern is that with the Supreme Court overturning Roe uh, and Justice um, Thomas, Thomas indicating that he thought that there were other connections to uh, communities like the LGBTQ community, the concern understandably is um, what can we do about it? 
And what I would say, um, again, that this is, uh, not everyone in my community will agree with this, but this is my position. I am firmly uh, in support of the LGBTQ community. Um, my, my, daughter, my daughter is queer, and my daughter will marry her, her fiance uh, this year, and I am enormously proud of the human being that she is. One of the reasons why I ran for Congress was my concern that, um, that communities like hers were going to be um, isolated and uh, others. And I do worry about this. And so what I would ask of you all, regardless of where you are politically, I, all I would ask on these issues is that you think of these individuals as people, you know, as human beings and as people who deserve love and um, who deserve to be able to be respected. And so I will do what I have done, which is vote for the pieces of legislation that support equality of all forms. Um, but we have a lot of work to do in this issue, in this area, because that piece of legislation, the one that I'm speaking of, is called the Equality Act. It has not been taken up by the Senate. Um, we have a lot of work to do in this area, and I just ask of you guys not to make this an R&D you know, issue, um, but to make it a pro pro people issue. What can we do as average citizens to prevent gun violence in the whole local community, especially in light of the limited gun violence legislation? Yeah, so what I would say, and this is a good question, what can, the question was what can we do about mm -hmm. gun violence or gun safety in our communities given that legislative solutions are not very common. Um, what I would say is be engaged, and that I think is something that we all have recognized as be really, being really important regardless of what the issue is we're talking about. Um, I am the first one to say that five years ago I wasn't engaged in, in my government the way that I ought to have been. You know, I served uh, in a variety of different ways and thought that serving in the for-profit sector or the nonprofit sector um, mm -hmm. was enough and that my government would take care of itself. Um, that, that is not my opinion any longer. And so what I would say on these issues is being engaged is the most important thing that you can do. Um, being uh, an organizer and active in your community on this issue and pressing your elected officials uh, to think about your opinions is really, really important, not just in gun safety, but on all these issues. And so whatever your issue is, um, being involved is really important. Does public money for private religious schools include non-Christian religions? Mm -hmm. Does public money for private schools religious private schools include <coughs> non-Christian religions. I'm assuming they're, you know, if I'm getting tied up in the question, but I'll try and get at what I think the question has to do with, which is, should public money go for private schools? Christian and non. Christian and non. I don't believe so. That's, that's my position. Um, and I also believe... <laughs> I, I, believe, I believe that my father is in the room. Um, uh, I, I believe that there is a line between um, uh, religion and government. And I, I think that that's a really important line to to. to Sure. Could you so, repeat it? so the question is basically: I, I'm a person, this person, uh, who wants unity, who wants you know, uh, to us to come together. How can I do that, or how can we do that? This way, right? Um, this is a deliberate uh, effort on on my part, on our office's part, to be available and to be accessible and to be transparent and to be present all the time. You know, there's. There's a reason why we try to do this as often as we do, and we try and move it around by place and by time and all of the places, the things that we can do. And there's a reason why we ask for civility and decency, because I really believe that our community wants that. I don't believe we want to be yelling at each other. Um, and so I think that just by behaving well, uh, I think is important. And I think it's also important, I say, let's say this to my daughter uh, as an example, to tell your story. You know, when something like Roe happened, the number of people who have told me their story, who had about why this was important to them, you know, was really remarkable, and it was it was devastating. 
Um, and so if you have a story about gun violence or uh, reproductive freedom or um, that health of the planet or all those kinds of things, share those stories. Um, I'm the only Democrat uh, north of the Mason-Dixon line in my family. Um, my, my, my entire parents, uh, mother's side of the family, and there's more than 50 of them, are all south of the Mason-Dixon line and are all Republicans. And I need to have family. You know, I need to have conversation with my with my community and my family. And so if the doors are shut, then that's when, that's when we have problems. And the last thing I would say is get off your social media. Uh, find human beings. <laughs> Please find human beings. Listen to me. I hope I hope I don't have sick heads for those of you guys who thought I might. You know, I, I hope that I said things that made sense, you know, for, for most of you guys. try to understand what, if anything, can or should be done uh, with the Supreme Court. And I don't know yet. I'm actually getting uh, some, I'm doing some readings, I'm getting some briefings, I'm looking at some legislation. I don't know what my position is quite yet. I love your input, you know, on it. Um, but I, I do worry, you know, I worry about everything being too politicized. You know, I, I just worry that the vast majority of us have pretty much similar concepts and ideas. And even though sometimes we don't you know, agree on, on certain things. I think if you really boiled it down, we would agree on 70 or 80% of the things. And it's the 20 or 30% that, you know, that we're, that we're not necessarily in agreement on. Um, but what I would say is that I think that the Supreme Court and what can or should be done is something that I need to do more research on. And I've been doing some reading already on it and looking at some legislative solutions already on it, but I'm not at a place where I have a position. Your thoughts on limited terms? <laughs> Court, Senate, whatever. Yeah, you know, th this is a question that I've been asked before too, the thoughts on limited terms or um, term limits. I have a couple of feelings on that. One is um, you want your person in that job to know what they're doing. <laughs> so it's helpful to have been there for a half hour and not to, you know, be turning over so frequently. It's helpful for somebody to have experience in these jobs. Otherwise, what you end up have it having happen is that the people who um, the people who are the staff members of, of you know the, the organization are running the machine, or the lobbyists are running the machine rather than the representative. You know, and so there really is something to be said for making sure that your representative has experience and tenure. Um, I don't know that there necessarily is something to be said for them being there for 40 years you know, or more. I don't think that that's necessarily an answer. Um, but I do think that there is some in between, and I think it's partially the responsibility of the electorate to say, hey, every two years I'm up for re-election, um, or every six, depending on you know, who it is. So you guys are the ultimate you know, interviewers of, my, of me and determinants of whether or not I continue to serve in this job. Um, and the other thing is that the person who sits in the seat has a responsibility to make sure that they are being um, effective and that they believe that they're representing their community and serving properly. Outside of clean energy related infrastructure projects, what federal resources are available for residents who are trying to transition to clean energy? So the question is, <clears throat> are there any federal resources available for people who are trying to transition to clean energy? I will get back to you on federal resources because some of those things have sunsetted and exist or don't exist any longer. But I can tell you that in the Build Back Better bill, there was a significant <clears throat> portion of that bill that was designed to try to innovate and, and um, in, encourage and incentivize a transition away uh, from our reliance on um, non-renewable energy sources. And so I'm hopeful that some aspects of that bill will be able to move forward. Um, it looks as though Senator Manchin, who is, as you probably read, the guy that, that's the guy, um, he seems to be interested in that, which is really cool. Um, because he uh, comes from a coal state, right? So it's sort of against type for him to say, hey, listen, when we pull together what we like about the Build Back Better, we're gonna look at prescription drugs, we're gonna look at childcare, we're gonna look at the environment. If they just, if that's what they do, God bless them. You know, that, that would be awesome. That would be an awesome move. Yeah. Okay, let's see if we have any 
others that are out there for you. Any more cards? Yep. Um, so that's what I would say is that um, I can, whoever asks ask this question, my guess is your answer is gonna come mostly from state and local, um, but the federal government certainly helps, you know, to create an environment where, where that's the case. Um, I know that as an example, there was some uh, support for uh, EV, uh, driving EVs, and I think that that has sunsetted. When was the last time you voted against Pelosi or voted differently from her? So that's a good question. <laughs> and let me explain that to you. Yeah. Of course. So let I me. I didn't ask that question. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> I just, you're my proxy. You're my proxy. Yeah. But I do follow your voting records. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about voting records for a second. I vote probably 80 times a week. Individual votes, uh, 80 times a week. Probably two-thirds of those are what's called suspension bills. And suspension bills are bills that are designed by their vote to suspend the rules. That's why they're called suspension bills. And that, that means that, they're, that we believe that we have a very bipartisan group of people who want to vote for that and support it. So two-thirds of, <laughs> two of the votes that I take are suspension bills. And as a result, I'll just wait for this. <laughs> as a result, both parties vote for those bills. Then there are the other third, roughly speaking, maybe, maybe less than that, I should take a look at the data. Of those bills, importantly, Speaker Pelosi actually very, very rarely votes. In fact, she doesn't have to vote at all. And so when you look at the board, look to see if she's voted or not. And one of the things that I would say to you is, I have voted with Spe Speaker Pelosi because the things that she votes on are important to the, the Democratic platform, the Democratic Party. That doesn't mean that I'm voting with the party every time. It just means that on those few votes that she takes, I'm voting with her. And you're right. But what I would also say is, what you don't see is the votes that never happened at all. Because people like me are behind the scenes saying, if you bring that to the floor for a vote, I will not vote for that. And there are just not enough of you, of us, to make that happen. And so don't do that. Um, and so I think that's also part of the, the process that people don't see. Another thing that people don't see is that I um, produce, I, I support sponsored legislation. It's really important to me that when I put my name on something, that it's um, likely or could happen. Not that it's just a you know, signature statement piece that we you know, that I wanna be able to prove to somebody that I supported that. I wanna make sure that it's bipartisan and it has an opportunity of moving forward. In my mind, that's the way that it has an opportunity of moving forward. I wanna make sure that it's coming out of the committee that is most likely to, to take it up or has a member who has standing in that area. Like as an example, I'm really um, passionate about national service. Um, I really want there to be a more aggressive and abundant national service program, not just military, but Teach for America. I did Teach for America, City or Peace Corps, those kinds of things. And there are a handful of people in the Congress who, if their name is on a national service bill, it might actually happen. You know, So I'll put my name on, on that bill. Um, I'll try my hardest to make sure that whatever I'm doing, I also am, am pushing for my leadership, the leadership, the Democratic leadership, to recognize that that means that's important to, to me and that that's important to my community. And I really try hard to make sure that my name is on as few things, frankly, as possible because I don't want it to be watered down. You know, there's our members of Congress who just basically litter the land with, you know, support and, and, and uh, sponsorships. And so that's, that's part of the answer is kind of how the, the numbers are made. Um, and anybody can make any piece of language, any, any number makes sense to you. What I will say is of the 435 members in Congress, I believe with the Luger Report, which is a report that measures your um, partisan, your bipartisanship or your partisanship, I'm in the top 25% in terms of bipartisanship. Um, so I work pretty darn hard uh, for our community to make sure that I'm speaking for as many of us as I possibly can. Oh, sorry, top 20%. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me, top 20%. And I believe this is the last part of okay. what we're trying for today. Mm -hmm. My mother is, a, is subject to VA benefits, and she was not able to file them, and I'm not a, allowed to apply for her. I tried a third party to make the application. Is it possible to check the status 
I think this is a really good place to end, which is that um, even though we talk a lot about legislation, the vast majority of what we do in our community is here, doing uh, constituent service and helping our community. Um, we've been able to sh close thousands of constituent cases, and those cases come to our office either in Westchester or in Reading, um, and we get a form from you that allows us permission to um, basically act on, on your behalf, which is what Sir Weaver talking about. Um, and then we get the opportunity to help sol solve the problem, whatever problem that you might have. And so I know that there, because I know firsthand that there are issues with VA benefits and who's allowed to be able to help who with them. Um, in fact, I mentioned that my brother is a vet, and at one point I really needed to help my brother. Um, and I struggled with being able to help him. Uh, but you know that these are issues of healthcare, right? And HIPAA and protection of, of privacy and security. But I don't know that there is no solution here. What I would encourage whoever wrote this card to do is work with our team. If you guys could raise your hands who are here in the room. Amazing, amazing group of people um, who are each in different you know, categories helping us either with uh, veterans benefits or uh, social security or visas or passports or all those kinds of things. So, please call our offices and we will fill out that form and get started on your case. Um, thank you. And I, can we have the last slide that has the... Oh, I already told that. All right. So <laughs> here, um, I think it's on one of these. Oh, it's right here, is um, how you can get in touch with me. It, it has our um, Twitter, because I know you're all on Twitter. Um, <laughs> it, it, it has our website as well on it. Um, so if you'd like to pick up one of these, there are ample ones here. This also is, for those of you who haven't had it, we'll give you a digital copy, a state of what I did sort of last year in, the, in this area. And again, reminders that this is an inflation report of what you can uh, see is what I'm pushing on for the, inflation, the issue of inflation. Uh, it's a privilege to serve you guys in the community. Thank you so much for coming.